subject of quite a few newspaper articles, allowing me to stitch together his history. He left the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, RADA, in 1999, and had been snapped up by Hamilton Hodel, one of the major talent agencies, whose clients include Tilda Swinton, Mark Rylance and Stephen Fry. For the next two years, he played a series of parts with the Royal Shakespeare Company, Ariel in The Tempest, Malcolm in Macbeth, the title role in Henry V. After that, he moved into television, starting with the BBC conspiracy thriller State of Play, which aired in 2003. He won his first BAFTA nomination for his role in Bleak House, another BBC drama, and in the same year picked up the Emerging Talent Award at the Evening Standard Theatre Awards for his performance as Algernon in The Importance of Being Earnest. It was rumoured that he turned down the opportunity to play Doctor Who, but David Tennant was cast instead, but by now his career was taking off in films. He had been directed by Woody Allen in Match Point, and followed this with Prince Caspian, two of the Harry Potter films, The Social Network, and, in 2009, the reboot of Star Trek. He moved to Hollywood that year, and was cast in two seasons of Mad Men. There was also a pilot that wasn't picked up. Finally, he'd been given the lead role in a new series, Homeland, with Claire Danes and Mandy Patinkin, which had been about to start shooting when his mother died. I'm not sure at what stage he'd been able to afford a two-bedroom flat on Brick Lane, but this was where he lived when he was in London. It was on the second floor of a warehouse that had been carefully converted to show off its original features. Stripped wooden floors, exposed beams, old-fashioned radiators, and lots of brickwork. My first impressions of the vast, double-height living room was that it looked almost fake, like a television set. There were different living areas, with an industrial-style kitchen stage left, then a seating area with vintage leather sofas and armchairs around a coffee table, and finally a raised platform with glass doors leading out to a roof terrace. I could see lots of terracotta pots and a gas barbecue on the other side. A Wurlitzer jukebox stood against the far wall. It had been beautifully renovated, with polished aluminium and neon lights. A spiral staircase led up to the next floor. Damien Cooper was waiting for us when we arrived, perched on a bar stool beside the kitchen counter. There was something that wasn't quite real about him, too. The languid pose, the shirt with its wide collar open at the neck, the gold chain resting against the chest hair, the tan. He could have been posing for the front cover of a fashion magazine. He was remarkably handsome, and probably knew it, with jet black hair swept back, intense blue eyes, and exactly the right amount of designer stubble. He looked tired, which might have been jet lag, but I was aware he had spent much of the day being interviewed by the police. There was also a funeral to arrange, or at least to attend. The arrangements, of course, had all been made for him. He had opened the door for us using an intercom, and he was talking on his mobile as he waved us in. Yeah, yeah, look, I'll get back to you. I have people here. Look after yourself, babe, I'll see you. He rang off. Hi, hi, I'm sorry about that. I only got back yesterday, and as you can imagine, it's a bit crazy around here. He had just enough of a transatlantic accent to be annoying. I remembered what Hawthorne had told me about money problems, girlfriends, drugs, and I decided at once that I believed him. Everything about Damien Cooper made my hackles rise. We shook hands. You want a coffee? Damien asked. He pointed at the sofa, inviting us to sit down. Thank you. He had one of those machines that take capsules and spin the milk round in a metal cylinder to froth it up. Can't tell you what a nightmare this whole thing's been. My poor mum. I spoke to the police for a long time yesterday afternoon, again this morning. When they told me the news, I couldn't believe it. Not at first. He stopped himself. I'll tell you anything you want to know. Anything I can do to help you catch the bastard who did this. When did you last see your mother? Hawthorne asked. That was the last time I was over in December. Damien opened the fridge and took out some milk. She wanted to spend time with the baby. She has a granddaughter. And it's easier for us to come here. I had some stuff to do anyway, so we spent Christmas together. She and Grace get on really well. I'm glad they were able to get to know each other a bit better. You and your mum were close. Even as Hawthorne spoke, there was a glint of something in his eye that suggested he thought otherwise. Yeah, of course we were. I mean, it wasn't easy for her when I moved to America, but she was a hundred percent behind my work. She was proud of what I was doing, and, you know, with Dad dying a long time ago and her never remarrying, I think my success meant a lot to her. He'd made two coffees 
drawing a pattern across the foam, even as he reminisced about his dead father. He glanced down at his work, then handed the cups over, adding, I can't tell you how gutted I was when I heard about it. She died over a week ago, Hawthorne remarked, without any particular rancor. I had things to deal with. We're rehearsing a new show. I had to shut down the house and get the dog looked after. You got a dog? That's nice. It's a Labradoodle. It was that last remark that made me wonder if the concerned, caring, recently bereaved Damien Cooper might not be quite as sincere as he seemed. It wasn't just that his new show had come first in his list of priorities. He wanted us to know the breed of his dog, as if it might somehow help the investigation into his mother's brutal murder. How often do the two of you speak? Hawthorne asked. Once a week, he paused. Well, once a fortnight, anyway. She used to come here and check the place out for me, water the plants on the terrace and all the rest of it. She forwarded my mail, he shrugged. We didn't always speak. She was busy and the time difference didn't help. We did lots of texts and emails. She texted you the day she died, I said. Yeah, I told the police about that. She said she was afraid. Do you know what she meant by that? She was referring to that kid, the one who got hurt in Deal. He was more than hurt, Hawthorne cut in. He had taken the corner of the sofa and was sitting there quite languidly with his legs crossed, more like a doctor than a detective. He's got serious brain damage. He needs twenty-four-hour care. It was an accident. Suddenly, Damien seemed agitated. He searched in his pockets and, guessing that he wanted a cigarette, Hawthorne offered him one of his own. Damien took it. They both lit up. Are you suggesting he's got something to do with what happened? Because I spent half the afternoon talking to the police. They didn't mention him. They think my mum died because of a burglary that went wrong. That may be one theory, Mr. Cooper, but it's my job to look at the whole picture. I'd be interested to know what you can tell me about Deal. After all, you were there. I wasn't in the car, Christ. He ran a hand through his immaculate hair. This was a man who wasn't used to being questioned, not unless it was for a glossy magazine. For once, there wasn't a publicist in the room guiding the interview. Look, it was ten years ago, he said. Mum was living in Warmer, which is the village next to Deal. We'd always lived there, to where I was born, and after Dad died, she wanted to stay. The house meant a lot to her. The house and the garden. It was her birthday, and I went down to see her for a few days. I'd just finished a run at the RSC, and I was reading scripts, thinking about what to do next. The accident happened on a Thursday. She'd gone to play golf. We were meant to be going out to dinner that night, but when she came in, she was in a terrible state. She said she'd forgotten her glasses, and she'd just hit someone in a car. She knew they were her, but she had no idea that she'd actually killed one of them. So why didn't she stop? I don't mind telling you the truth, Mr. Hawthorne. After all, you can't prosecute her now. The fact of the matter is that she was worried about me. My career was taking off. I just had fantastic reviews for Henry V, and they were even talking about taking it to Broadway. She thought that the bad publicity might hurt me, and I'm not saying she wouldn't have turned herself into the police. That was never in her mind. She just wanted to talk to me first. She'd killed a child. Suddenly, Hawthorne was leaning forward, accusingly. It was another of those instant transformations I was getting used to, from witness to prosecutor, from friend to dangerous enemy. I've already told you she didn't know. He paused. Anyway, for what it's worth, there were plenty of things about that accident that never added up. Such as? Well, the nanny said that the two children ran across the road to get to an ice cream shop, but the ice cream shop was closed, so that doesn't make any sense. And then there was the question of the witness who disappeared. What witness was that? A man who was first on the scene. He tried to help, but when the police and the ambulance arrived, he suddenly took off, and nobody ever found out who he was or what he'd seen. Not at the inquest, not in court. Are you suggesting your mother wasn't responsible? No. Damien drew on his cigarette. He held it like a black-and-white film star in the O formed by his thumb and index finger. Mum should have been wearing her glasses, and she knew that. You have no idea how much it all upset her. She never drove again, and although it broke her heart, she realised she couldn't stay living in Warmer. A few months later, she sold up and moved to London. Outside, in another room, we heard a telephone ring a few times before it was picked up. So she never had any further communication with the family? Hawthorne asked. The Godwins? Damien shrugged. 
she did have further communication with them, very much so. They never forgave her, and they never accepted the court's verdict. In fact, the father, Alan Godwin, was hassling her just a couple of weeks before she died. How do you know? She told me. He actually came to the house in Britannia Road. Can you believe that? He was asking her for money to support his failed business. And when she told him to leave, he wrote to her. If you ask me, that's harassment. I told her to go to the police. Alan Godwin had lost a child. His other child had been crippled. It was hard to think of Damien Cooper as the victim in all this. But before Hawthorne could say as much, a young, very attractive black woman came down the spiral stairs, leading a little girl by the hand and holding a mobile phone. Dame, it's Jason, she said. She sounded nervous. He says it's important. Sure. He took the phone from her and began to walk towards the terrace. I'm sorry, it's my manager. I've got to take this. He stopped at the window and frowned. I thought you were putting Ashley down for a nap. She's jet-lagged. She doesn't know if it's night or day. He went outside, leaving us with the woman and her child. This had to be Grace Lavelle. There could be no doubt that she was, or had been, a model or an actress. She had the physique and the confidence that go with the job, a sort of look-at-me quality that demanded to be put on the screen. She was in her early thirties, quite tall, with very high cheekbones, a long neck and delicate rounded shoulders. She was wearing the skinniest of jeans and an expensive loose-knit jersey that floated off her. The toddler couldn't have been more than three. She was staring at us with saucer eyes. I imagined she'd have to get used to being trundled around the world. I'm Grace, she said, and this is Ashley. Gonna say hello, Ashley? The child said nothing. Has Damien offered you coffee? We're okay, thank you. Are you here about Diana? I'm afraid so. He's totally destroyed by this, although you probably won't have seen it. Damien is very good at hiding his feelings. I wondered why she felt the need to defend him. He was devastated when he heard the news, she went on. He adored his mum. He mentioned you were with her last Christmas. Yes. We did spend some time together, although she was more interested in Ashley than me. She took a carton of juice out of the fridge, poured some into a plastic cup, and handed it to the child. I suppose that's understandable, the first grandchild thing. Are you an actor too? I asked. Yes. Well, I was. That's how we met. We were at RADA together. He played Hamlet. It was a fantastic production. They still talk about it years later. Everyone knew he was going to be a star. I was Ophelia. You've been together for a while, then? No. After RADA, he got picked up by the RSC and went off to Stratford-upon-Avon. I did a whole load of TV, Holby City, Jonathan Creek, Queer as Folk, that sort of thing. We actually met up again a few years ago. It was a first night party at the National. We got together and then Ashley came along. It must be difficult for you, I said, having to stay at home. Not really. It's my choice. I didn't believe her. There was a nervousness in her eyes. I'd seen it when she held up the telephone for Damien. She'd been afraid he was going to snatch it from her. In fact, she was probably afraid of Damien. I had no doubt that success had made him a very different man from the one she'd met at drama school. Damien had finished the call and came back into the room. Sorry about that, he said. They're all going crazy out there. We'll start shooting next week. What did he want? Grace asked. He wants to know when I'm coming back. Jesus. Such an arsehole. I've only just arrived. He looked at his watch, a great chunk of steel with several dials. It's five o'clock in the morning in L.A. He's already on his treadmill. I could hear it as he talked. When will you go back? Hawthorne asked. The funeral's Friday. We'll go back the day after. Oh. Grace's face fell. I hope we could stay longer. I'm meant to be rehearsing, you know that. I wanted to spend a bit of time with Mum and Dad. You've already had a week with them, babe. That word, babe, sounded both patronising and faintly menacing. Is there anything else you need? He asked us, his mind clearly elsewhere. I don't see how I can really help you. I told everything I know to the police, and to be honest with you, their investigation seems to be moving in a completely different direction. Losing Mum is bad enough, but having to go over what happened in Deal really sucks. Hawthorne grimaced, as if it genuinely upset him to continue with this line of inquiry. 
It didn't stop him, though. Did you know your mother had planned the funeral? He demanded. No, she didn't tell me. Do you have any idea why she might have decided to do that? Not really. She was someone who was very organised. That was part of her character. The funeral, the will, all of that. You know about the will. When Damien was angry, two little pinpricks of red, almost like light bulbs, appeared in his cheeks. I've always known about the will, he said, but I'm not going to discuss it with you. I imagine she left everything to you. As I said, that's private. Hawthorne stood up. I'll see you at the funeral. I understand you're going to be performing. Actually, that's not what I'd call it. Mum left instructions for me to say a few words, and... Grace is going to read a poem. Sylvia Plath, Grace said. I didn't know she liked Plath, but I had a call from the undertaker, a woman called Irene Laws. Apparently everything was written down. You don't think it's a bit strange that she made all these arrangements the same day she died? The question seemed to annoy him. I think it was a coincidence. A funny coincidence. I don't see anything funny in it at all. Damien walked over to the front door and opened it for us. It's been nice meeting you, he said. He hadn't even tried to make that sound sincere. We left and went down the single flight of stairs and out into the busy street. Once we got there, Hawthorne stopped. He looked back, deep in thought. I missed something, he said. What? I don't know what. It was when you asked him about the text that Diana Cooper sent. After what I told you, why couldn't you keep your mouth shut? The hell with you, Hawthorne! Right then, I'd really had enough. Don't you ever talk to me like that. I'm listening to you, I'm taking notes, but if you think I'm going to follow you around London like some kind of pet dog, you can forget it. I'm not stupid. What was wrong with asking him about the text? It's obviously relevant. Hawthorne glared at me. You think. Well, isn't it? I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But there was something he just told me that was important. You broke my train of thought, and I haven't picked up on it. That's all I'm saying. You can ask him at the funeral. I walked away. Let me know what he says. It's eleven o'clock on Friday, he called after me. Brompton Cemetery. I stopped and turned round. I can't come. I'm busy. He stalked after me. You've got to be there. It's a big deal. That's what this is all about, remember? She wanted a funeral. And I've got an important meeting. I'm sorry. You'll just have to take notes and tell me about it afterwards. I'm sure you'll be more accurate than me, anyway. I saw a taxi and flagged it down. This time, Hawthorne didn't try to stop me. I was careful not to turn round, but I saw him reflected in the mirror, standing there, lighting another cigarette, as we accelerated round a corner. 10. Script Conference There was a reason why I couldn't attend the funeral. The day before, I'd finally had a phone call from Steven Spielberg's office. Both he and Peter Jackson had arrived in London and wanted to meet me to discuss the first draft of the Tintin script at the Soho Hotel in Richmond Mews, just off Dean Street. I know the hotel well, although it's hard to believe it was once an NCP car park. The low ceilings and the lack of windows are the only clues, but has now become something of a focal point for the British film industry. It's surrounded by production houses and post-production facilities and has two screening rooms of its own. Once or twice I've had lunch in its busy ground-floor restaurant, Refuel. It's almost impossible not to spot someone you know, and the very fact that you're meeting there can make you feel that, somehow, you've arrived. In this respect, it's London's own little corner of Los Angeles. I forgot all about Damien Cooper and his mother for the next couple of days. Instead, I immersed myself in the script, going through it line by line, trying to remember the thought processes that had got me this far. I was convinced that there were lots of good things in it, but I still had to be prepared to fight my corner if need be. I wasn't sure how either Jackson as director or Spielberg as producer was going to respond to my work. This was the problem. Tintin is a European phenomenon, and one that has never been particularly popular across the Atlantic. Part of the reason for this may be historical. The 1932 album, Tintin in America, is a ruthless satire on the United States, showing Americans to be vicious, corrupt, and insatiable. 
The very first panel shows a policeman saluting a masked bandit who is walking past with a smoking gun. And no sooner has Tintin arrived in New York and climbed into a taxi than he finds himself being kidnapped by the mob. The entire history of Native Americans is brilliantly told in five panels. Oil is discovered on a reservation. Cigar-smoking businessmen move in. Soldiers drive the crying Native American children off their land. Builders and bankers arrive. Just one day later, a policeman tells Tintin to get out of the way of a major traffic intersection. Where do you think you are? The Wild West? There's a total cultural disconnect, too. What would the Americans make of the bizarre relationships that seem quite normal in the world of Tintin? There are his friendships with the not entirely reformed drunk Captain Haddock, and with the stone-deaf Professor Calculus, who was given no part in the first film. There is a talking dog. There are the idiotic one-joke detectives, Thompson and Thompson, who can only be told apart by the shapes of their moustaches. But most of all, there is the inconsequentiality of the adventures. Marvel and DC Comics dealt with fantastical characters, but at least they sent them on recognisable journeys, providing them with origin stories, personal tragedies. The villain Magneto was revealed to be a Holocaust survivor. Love affairs, psychological issues, political awakenings and all the rest of it. Very few of the Tintin albums have anything that comes close to a proper narrative shape, and one of them, the Castafiori Emerald, was deliberately designed to have no story at all. Tintin has no girlfriend. Although he is supposedly a journalist, he is hardly ever seen to work. His age is indeterminate. He could actually be a child, a grown-up Boy Scout. His dress sense and hairstyle are ridiculous. Unlike all the other characters who are carefully delineated, he is deliberately drawn as a cipher. His face is made up of three dots for his eyes and mouth, and a small letter C, which is his nose. Although presumably Belgian, he has no national characteristic that might make him a foreigner abroad. He has no parents, no real home, until he moves into Marlin Spike Hall with Captain Haddock, no emotions beyond a desire to travel and have adventures. How could he possibly be the hero of a $135 million Hollywood film? I had been drawn into the world of Tintin in a rather strange way. I had originally been invited to work on the computer game that would go out with the first film, The Secret of the Unicorn, working with a French company who had just had a huge hit with Assassin's Creed. This isn't something I would normally consider. I don't play computer games. I don't particularly like them. And writing random dialogue for nameless pirates wandering around the deck of the Unicorn didn't particularly appeal to me, even if, in an early draft, I had them all earnestly discussing my books. But the truth is that Spielberg is Spielberg, and I wondered where the job might take me. It took me to Wellington and the home of Peter Jackson. Somehow I found myself drawn into the sequel just as the first film was nearing completion. Even more bizarrely, it turned out that the secret of the unicorn had problems, and almost by accident I was asked to help with the shape and the narrative flow, even to add a few extra scenes. Some of these actually made the final cut. There's a tiny moment in the film when a man runs into a lamppost. He falls to the floor, and in the style of a Hergé illustration, a little circle of Tweety Birds flutter around his head. But there's a twist. The camera pulls back to reveal that the incident has taken place outside a pet shop, and the birds are real. The owner is there with a net, trying to recapture them. I mention this only because it was filmed by Steven Spielberg, and in all the writing I've ever done over forty years, it's probably the scene of which I'm most proud. When he showed it to me in a Los Angeles screening room, I almost leapt off the sofa in excitement. This was the man who had shot Jaws, E.T., Indiana Jones, Schindler's List, and now his filmography included Forty Seconds by Me. In fact, when I look back at the entire Tintin experience, that's the moment I like to remember. Nothing else was ever quite as good again. That said, I loved working with Peter Jackson. In fact, I'd liked him the moment I met him at the Weta Studios in Wellington. He showed me a long corridor with a stationery cupboard about halfway down. This was actually the secret entrance to his office. He pressed a button, and the back wall swung open on hidden hydraulics, revealing a huge space behind. A secret door. The Tintin books are full of them. I even have one, although it's much less elaborate, in my home in London. Jackson was such a pleasant, even-tempered, amicable man that it was easy to forget that, with The Lord of the Rings, he had written, produced, and directed three of the most successful blockbusters in cinema history, making himself hundreds of millions of dollars in the process. Nothing about the way he dressed or the way he lived fitted the stereotype of the movie mogul. 
After that first meeting, we usually worked at his house, which I remember as being messy, cosy, lived in. When it was time for lunch, his assistant would phone one of the Wellington takeaways. The food was awful. Together, we had decided to adapt one of Hergé's double albums, The Seven Crystal Balls and Prisoners of the Sun. The story begins with a group of professors who stumble, Tutankhamun style, on the tomb of the high priest Raskar Kapak. They are searching for an ancient bracelet which has magical properties and which will in turn lead to the Inca's lost city of gold, or something like that. By the time I finished the screenplay, about half the story was Hergé's and quite a bit of it was mine. I'd added one or two huge action sequences, including a chase on two steam trains that turned into a roller coaster ride around the Andes, and a new climax that involved an entire golden mountain being melted by a primitive laser. We couldn't use the actual ending of the book, An Eclipse, because it had appeared in another very successful film, Mel Gibson's Apocalypto, five years before. So that was how things stood as I went into the meeting at the Soho Hotel. Peter Jackson had already told me he had notes, but that was hardly surprising. A screenplay for a film of this size might pass through twenty or thirty drafts before it was ready for production and I would almost certainly be fired somewhere along the way. I was quite prepared for that. I just hoped I wouldn't be dropped immediately. It would be nice if they let me have two or three attempts to get the script right. At this stage, incidentally, the secret of the unicorn hadn't been released. I had seen it, and I thought it was extraordinary. Spielberg had used a technique called motion capture, which had magically transformed the actors Jamie Bell and Andy Serkis into Tintin and Haddock. Both of them were lined up for the sequel. I arrived at the Soho Hotel at ten o'clock, as I had been instructed, and I was shown into a room on the first floor with a large conference table, three glasses, and a bottle of Fiji mineral water. Peter Jackson arrived a few minutes later. He was as genial as ever, with the crumpled look of someone who had just flown across the world. He had lost a lot of weight, and his clothes were hanging off him. We talked about London, the weather, recent movies, anything except the script. Then the door opened, and Spielberg came in. He tended to wear more or less the same clothes, a leather jacket, jeans, trainers, a baseball cap. His glasses and beard made him instantly recognisable. As always, I had to remind myself that this was really happening, that I was sitting in the same room as him. He was someone I'd wanted to meet pretty much all my life. Spielberg got straight to the point. I've never come across anyone so focused on filmmaking and storytelling. In the short time that I'd known him, he'd never asked me a personal question and it often struck me that he had no interest in me outside what I had put on the page. I had been wondering where he would begin. Did he like my way into the narrative? Did the characters work? Were the action sequences in the right place? Were my jokes funny? I always dread the moment when a director opens a script of mine. The first words that come out of his or her mouth may change the next year of my life. You've chosen the wrong book, he said. It was impossible. Peter and I had discussed which books we were going to adapt when we were in Wellington. I'd spent three months on this draft. It was the last thing I had expected him to say. I'm sorry? I'm not sure those were the exact words I used. The Seven Crystal Balls, Prisoners of the Sun, those are the wrong books. Why? I don't want to do them. I turned to Peter. He nodded. Okay. And that actually was it. It didn't matter that Peter Jackson was directing and Spielberg was producing. They both had copies of my script, but we weren't going to discuss it at all. Not the plot, the characters, the action, the jokes. There was nothing to talk about. We can do Prisoners of the Sun as the third film, Peter said, brushing it aside with a casual wave of his hand. Which book do you think Anthony should start working on for number two? Anthony. That was me. I wasn't going to be fired. But before Spielberg could answer, the door opened again, and, to my shock and utter dismay, Hawthorne walked in. As always, he was in his suit and white shirt, but this time he'd also put on a black tie. For the funeral. He didn't seem to have any idea what sort of meeting he'd just interrupted, or how important it was to me. He wandered in as if he'd been invited, and when he saw me, he smiled as if he hadn't expected me to be there. Tony he said. I've been looking for you. I'm busy, I said, feeling the blood rush to my face. I oh, know, I can see that, mate. You must have forgotten. The funeral. I told you, I can't come to the funeral. 
who's died? Peter Jackson asked. I glanced at him. He looked genuinely concerned. On the other side of the table, Spielberg was sitting very straight, a little annoyed. I could imagine that he belonged to a world where nobody would walk in unless they were expected, and only if they were being escorted by an assistant. Apart from anything else, there was his security to consider. It's nobody, I said. I still couldn't quite believe Hawthorne had come here. Was he deliberately trying to embarrass me? I told you, I said quietly. I really can't come. But you have to. It's important. Who are you? Spielberg asked. Hawthorne pretended to notice him for the first time. I'm Hawthorne, he said. I'm with the police. You're a police officer? No, no, he's a consultant, I cut in. He's helping the police with an investigation. A murder, Hawthorne explained, helpfully, once again sitting on that first vowel to make the word somehow more violent than it already was. He was looking at Spielberg, only now recognising. Do I know you? he asked. I'm Steven Spielberg. Are you in films? I wanted to weep. That's right, I make films. This is Steven Spielberg, and this is Peter Jackson. I don't know why I said that. Part of me was trying to take back control. Perhaps I was hoping I could overawe Hawthorne and get him out of the room. Peter Jackson? Hawthorne's face brightened. You did those three films. The Lord of the Rings. That's right. Jackson was relaxed. Did you see them? I watched them on DVD with my son. He thought they were great. Thank you. The first one, anyway. He wasn't too sure about the second. What was it called? The Two Towers. Peter was still smiling, even if it was a smile that had slightly frozen in place. We didn't much like those trees, the talking trees. We thought they were stupid. You mean the Ents? Whatever. And Gandalf. I thought he was dead, and I was a bit surprised when he turned up again. Hawthorne thought for a moment, and I waited with a sense of mounting dread for what was going to come next. The actor who played him, Ian McEwen, he was a bit over the top. Sir Ian McKellen. He was nominated for an Oscar. That may be the case, but did he win it? Mr Hawthorne is a special consultant for Scotland Yard, I cut in. I've been commissioned to write a book about his latest case. It's called Hawthorne Investigates, Hawthorne said. Spielberg considered. I like that title, he said. That's good, Jackson agreed. Hawthorne glanced at his watch. We've got the funeral at eleven o'clock, he explained. And I've already said I can't be there. You have to be there, Tony. I mean, everyone who ever knew Diana Cooper is going to attend. It's an opportunity to see them all interacting. You could say it's a bit like having a read-through before a film. You wouldn't want to miss that, would you? I explained. Diana Cooper? Spielberg said. Isn't that Damien Cooper's mother? No, sir. She was strangled in her own house. I heard. It had often struck me that Spielberg, the man who had shot the bloodiest opening in cinema history with Saving Private Ryan, and who had recreated Nazi atrocities in Schindler's List, didn't actually like talking about violence. I could have sworn he'd gone a little pale once when I was outlining an idea I'd had for Tintin. Now he turned to Peter. I met Damien Cooper last month. He came in for a chat about Warhorse. Poor kid, Peter Jackson said. That's a horrible thing to happen. I agree. Both Spielberg and Jackson were looking at me as if I had known Damien Cooper all my life and not attending his mother's funeral would be the meanest thing I could possibly do. Meanwhile, Hawthorne was sitting there like some passing angel who'd wafted in to appeal to my better conscience. I really think you should go, Anthony, Spielberg said. But it's just a book, I assured them. To be honest, I'm having second thoughts about writing it. This film is much more important to me. Well, we don't really have much to talk about where the second movie is concerned, Peter said. Maybe we all need to take a rain check and rethink where we are in a couple of weeks. We can do a conference call, Spielberg said. We'd been talking about Tintin for less than two minutes. My script had been thrown out in its entirety, and before I could start coming up with ideas for the Calculus Affair or Destination Moon or even Flight 714 to Sydney, spaceships, Spielberg liked spaceships, didn't he? I was being thrown out. It wasn't fair. 
I was in a meeting with the two greatest filmmakers in the world. I was meant to be writing a film for them, and yet I was being dragged out to the funeral of someone I hadn't even met. Hawthorne got to his feet. It tells you something about my state of mind that I hadn't even noticed when he'd sat down. Very nice to meet you, he said. Sure, Spielberg said. Do please pass on my condolences to Damien. I'll do that. And don't worry, Anthony, we'll give your agent a call. They never did call my agent. In fact, I never saw either of them again. And my only consolation as I sit here now is that so far there has been no new Tintin film. The Secret of the Unicorn got rave reviews and made $375 million worldwide, but the response in America was less enthusiastic. Maybe that's dissuaded them from continuing with the sequel. Or maybe they're working on it now, without me. They seem very nice, Hawthorne said as he walked down the corridor. For Christ's sake, I exploded. I told you I didn't want to come to the funeral. Why did you come here? How did you even know where I was? I rang your assistant. And she told you? Listen. Hawthorne was trying to calm me down. You don't want to do Tintin. It's for children. I thought you were leaving all that stuff behind you. It's being produced by Steven Spielberg, I exclaimed. Well, maybe he'll make a film of your new book. A murder story. He knows Damien Cooper. We pushed through the main doors of the hotel and went out into the street. Who do you think will play me? Eleven. The Funeral I know Brompton Cemetery well. When I was in my twenties, I had a room in a flat just five minutes away, and on a hot summer afternoon I'd wander in and write there. It was somewhere quiet, away from the dust and the traffic, a world of its own. In fact, it's one of the most impressive cemeteries in London, a member of the so-called Magnificent Seven, with a striking array of Gothic mausoleums and colonnades peopled by stone angels and saints, all of them constructed by the Victorians, partly to celebrate death, but also to keep it in its place. There's a main avenue that runs in a straight line all the way from one end to the other, and walking there on a sunny day, I could easily imagine myself in ancient Rome. I would find a bench and sit there with my notebooks, watching the squirrels and the occasional fox, and, on a Saturday afternoon, listening to the distant clamour of the crowd at Stamford Bridge Football Club on the other side of the trees. It's strange how different locations around London have played such a large part in my work. The River Thames is one of them. Brompton Cemetery is most certainly another. It was ten to eleven when Hawthorne and I arrived and made our way between the two red telephone boxes that seemed to stand guard on either side of the main gate. We followed a narrow, twisty path with bollards that could be lowered to allow vehicles, presumably hearses, to come in. A few mourners walked ahead of us. This part of the cemetery was shabbier and more depressing than I remembered. I noticed a headless statue on a plinth. Another greeted us with a severed arm. I took pictures of them with my iPhone. A few pigeons pecked at the grass. We turned a corner, and the Brompton Chapel appeared ahead of us a building that consisted of a perfect circle with two wings. If viewed from above, it would have the same shape as a London Underground sign, vaguely appropriate when you think about it. We had approached it from the back, and, sure enough, there was a hearse parked on a square of concrete next to an open door. The willow casket that Diana Cooper had requested was inside, as, I realised with a jolt in my stomach, was she. Four men in black tailcoats stood waiting to carry her in. The path bent round and brought us to the main entrance, a door with four pillars facing north. There was a small crowd making its way inside. Nobody was speaking to each other, instead keeping their heads down as if they were embarrassed to be there. It felt odd joining them when I had never met Diana Cooper. I had never even heard of her until a week ago. As a rule, I don't go to funerals. I find them too horrible and upsetting, and the older I get, of course, the more invitations I receive. As a favour to my friends, I'll make sure that none of them are told the date of mine. I recognised quite a few of the people who had turned up to this one. Andrea Kluvanek had decided to come to say goodbye to her old employer, and was just disappearing in through the door as we turned the corner. Raymond Clunes was also there, wearing a brand new black cashmere coat that he might have bought specially for the occasion. He had brought a younger, bearded man with him, quite possibly his partner. I glanced nervously at Hawthorne, who was watching them with narrow, guarded eyes. 
Fortunately, at least for the time being, he was saying nothing. Clunes was also being observed by a second remarkably handsome man, possibly Hong Kong Chinese, with long black hair curling down to his shoulders. He was immaculately dressed in a suit and white silk shirt, fastened with one of those Dr. No collars and black shoes that had been polished until they dazzled. Curiously, I had met him once before. His name was Bruno Wang, and, like Clunes, he was a major theatre producer. He was also a well-known philanthropist, on first-name terms with various members of the royal family, and had given large sums to the arts. He often came to first nights at the Old Vic Theatre, where I was on the board. From the way he was looking at Clunes, I could tell at once that the two men were definitely not friends. We found ourselves next to him at the door, and I greeted him. Did you know Diana Cooper? I asked. She was a dear, dear friend, Wang replied. He spoke softly, always considering his next words, as if he was about to recite a poem. A woman of great kindness and spirituality. I was devastated to hear the news of her passing, and it almost breaks my heart to be here today. Was she one of your investors? I asked. Sadly not. I had invited her many times. She had exceptional taste. Unfortunately, her judgment could sometimes be found wanting. If she had one fault, it was that she had too kind a heart. She was too trusting. I did speak to her. Only a few weeks ago I tried to warn her. What did you warn her about? Hawthorne asked. He had effortlessly stepped into the forefront, pushing me aside. Wang looked around. We were on our own. Everyone else had gone into the chapel ahead of us. I don't want to speak out of turn. Why don't you give it a try? I don't think we've met. Wang had been put on the defensive, and frankly I wasn't surprised. Hawthorne's brand of low-key menace, the pale skin, the haunted eyes— was off-putting at the best of times. In a cemetery, it was positively sinister. If a vampire had decided to turn up for the funeral, it might have been less unnerving. This is Daniel Hawthorne, I said. He's a police investigator looking into what happened. You know Raymond Clunes? Hawthorne asked. He had also noticed Wang examining the other man just a few moments before. I can't say I know him, but we've met. And? I don't like to speak unkindly about another human being, Wang said in his carefully measured way, and particularly not in a place such as this. In my view, there's already too much unkindness in the world. However, he drew a breath. You will find, I think, that Raymond Clunes is being investigated by the authorities. He made certain claims with respect to his last production, which turned out to be, to say the least, exaggerated. Are you talking about Moroccan nights? I asked. I did tell, dear Diana, just a few weeks before the tragedy that took her from us. She was fully intending to take action, which, in my view, she had every right to do. But then she got strangled, Hawthorne said flatly. Wang stared at him making the connection for the first time. I understood that it was a burglary. I don't think it was a burglary. In that case, I've probably said too much. I don't think Diana had invested a great deal of money. I certainly didn't mean to imply anything untoward. He spread his hands. Excuse me, I don't want to miss the service. He hurried inside. We were left alone. So that's interesting, Hawthorne said, as much to himself as to me. She finds out Clunes has been stiff enough. She plans to have it out with him, and before you know it, she's a stiff herself. That's a nice way of putting it. That's my pleasure. You can use it. There were a couple of men loitering a short distance away with cameras. I only noticed them when one of them snapped a photograph. Fucking journalists, Hawthorne muttered. It was true. They must have come here to catch a shot of Damien Cooper. What have you got against journalists? I asked, thinking I might have to add them to the list. 
Hawthorne threw down the cigarette he'd been smoking and ground it out beneath his foot. Nothing. We always used to get them sniffing around the crime scene. They never got anything right. We went into the chapel. It was a circular space, white, with pillars holding up a domed roof, and windows positioned too high up to allow a view of anything other than the sky. About forty chairs had been arranged to face the coffin, which was being carried in as we took our places. Looked at more closely, the coffin had a strange and unfortunate resemblance to an enormous picnic basket, the lid fastened with two leather straps. There was a yellow and white floral garland resting on the top. A recording of Jeremiah Clark's trumpet voluntary was already playing on the speaker system. It was odd because, of course, that piece of music is more often associated with weddings. I wondered if it had accompanied Diana Cooper down the aisle when she got married. The coffin was carefully laid down on two trestles, and while that was happening, I examined the rest of the crowd, a little surprised by how few people had turned out. There couldn't have been more than a couple of dozen in the room. Bruno Wang and Raymond Clunes were both in the front row, some distance apart. Andrea, in a cheap black leather jacket, was over to the side. Detective Inspector Jack Meadows had turned up too. I saw him stifling a yawn, sitting uncomfortably on a chair that was slightly too small for him. I suppose Damien Cooper had the star role in this production, and he seemed to know it. He had dressed for the part in a beautifully tailored suit, grey shirt, and black silk tie. Grace Lavelle was next to him, in a black dress, but there was a space around them as if this was the VIP area of the chapel, and the other mourners could notice them, but please, don't come too close. I'm not exaggerating. There were only two people sitting in the row behind him. Later I would discover that one of them had been sent by Damien's London agent, and the other was his personal trainer, a very muscular black man who seemed to be acting as his bodyguard. Otherwise, the congregation was made up of friends and colleagues of Diana Cooper, none of them under fifty. Looking around, it struck me that although there were a great many emotions on display in the chapel, boredom, curiosity, seriousness, nobody seemed particularly sad. The only person who showed any sense of loss was a tall man with straggly hair sitting a few chairs away from me. As the vicar stood up and approached the coffin, he took out a white handkerchief and dabbed at his eyes. The vicar was a woman, short, fleshy, with a downturned smile. I know this is a sad occasion, she seemed to be saying, but I'm very glad you're here. I could see that she was going to be modern rather than traditional in her approach. She waited until the music ended, then stepped forward, rubbed her hands together, and began her address. Hello, everybody. I'm so very glad to welcome you here to this very beautiful chapel built in 1839 and inspired by St. Peter's in Rome. I think it's a very special, very beautiful place to come together to pay our respects to a lovely, lovely lady. Death is always difficult for those of us who are left behind, and as we say goodbye to Diana Cooper, who was snatched so very suddenly and violently from the path of life, it's particularly hard to see any reason for it, and it's very difficult to come to terms with what has happened. I was already wishing she'd stop saying very all the time. I wondered if Diana Cooper would have enjoyed being described as a lovely, lovely lady. It made her sound like a special guest on a television game show. Diana was someone who always tried to help. She did a fantastic amount of work for charity. She was on the board of the Globe Theatre. And, of course, she was the mother of a very famous son. Damien has flown all the way from America to be here today, and although we understand the sadness you must be feeling, Damien, we're very, very glad to see you. I turned round and noticed Robert Cornwallis, the undertaker, standing next to the door. He was whispering quietly to Irene Laws, both of them dressed formally for the funeral. She nodded, and he slipped outside. I thought briefly of Steven Spielberg and Peter Jackson, who were probably still at the Soho Hotel. Maybe they'd pop down together for an early lunch at Refuel, and I should have been with them. I felt a surge of rage at having been dragged here. Diana Cooper was someone who was aware of her own mortality. The vicar was still talking. She had arranged every aspect of today's service, including the music you have just heard. She wanted to keep it short, so that's enough from me. We're going to begin with Psalm 34. I hope that when Diana chose this, she understood that death is not something always to be feared. 
the righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Death can be a comfort, too. The vicar read the psalm. Then Grace Lavelle stood up, walked forward, and recited Ariel by Sylvia Plath. Stasis in darkness, then the substanceless blue pour of tor and distances. I was impressed that she had learned it off by heart, and she certainly put her heart into it. Damien watched her with a strange coolness in his handsome eyes. Next to me, Hawthorne yawned. Finally, it was Damien's turn. He got up and walked slowly forward, then turned so that he was standing with his back to his mother's coffin. His words were brief and unemotional. I was just twenty-one when my dad died, and now I've lost my mother too. It's harder to come to terms with what happened to her because dad was ill, but mum was attacked in her own home, and I was away in America when it happened. I'll always be sorry that I never got a chance to say goodbye, but I know she was proud of what I was doing. And I think she'd have enjoyed my new show, which starts shooting next week. It's called Homeland, and it should be on Showtime later this year. Mum always supported me, being an actor. She encouraged me, and she had total belief that I'd become a star. She came to every one of my productions, when I was at Stratford, Ariel and the Tempest, Henry V, and Mephistopheles in Dr. Faustus, which was her favourite. She always said I was her little devil. This got a few murmurs of sympathetic laughter from the mourners. I think I'll always look for her in the audience when I'm on stage, and I'm always going to see the empty seat. I hope they can resell the ticket. They were less sure about that last remark. Was it actually a joke? I had been recording everything he said on my iPhone, but I stopped listening at this point. Damien Cooper's funeral address had confirmed my feelings about him. He talked for a few more minutes. And then the sound system came back on with Eleanor Rigby. The doors were opened, and we all trooped out into the cemetery. The man with the straggly hair was right in front of us. He dabbed at his eyes a second time. We traipsed off to the western side of the cemetery behind the colonnades. A grave had been dug in a long stretch of unkempt grass next to a low wall. There was a railway line on the other side. I couldn't see it, but as we walked forward, I heard a train go past. We came to a gravestone with the inscription "Lawrence Cooper, 3rd of April 1950, 22nd of October 1999, after a long illness, born with fortitude." I remembered that he had lived and presumably died in Kent, and wondered how he had come to be buried here. The sun was shining, but a couple of plane trees provided shade. It was a pleasant, warm afternoon. Damien Cooper, Grace Lavelle. And the vicar had stayed behind to accompany the body on its last journey. And as we waited for them, Detective Inspector Meadows lumbered over to us. He was wearing a suit that could have come out of a charity shop, or should have been on the way to one. So how's it going, Hawthorne? He asked. Not too bad, Jack. You were getting anywhere with this? Meadows sniffed. You don't want to solve it too soon, I'd have thought. Not for your being paid by the day. I'll wait for you to come up with an answer," Hawthorne said. "That way, I'll make a fortune. Actually, I may have to disappoint you there. It looks like we're closing in. Really? I asked. If Meadows actually solved the case before Hawthorne, it would be catastrophic for the book. Yes, you'll read about it in the newspapers soon enough, so I might as well tell you now. There have been three burglaries in the area around Britannia Road recently with an identical M.O. The intruder, dressed up as a dispatch rider, delivering a package. A motorbike helmet covered his face. He targeted single women living on their own. And he murdered them all, did he? No. He beat up the first two and locked them in a cupboard while he ransacked their houses. The third one was smart. She didn't let him in. She dialed nine 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 and he hiked it. But we know who we're looking for. We're looking at CCTV footage now. We should be able to track down the bike without too much trouble, and that will lead us to him. And what's your theory for how Diana Cooper got herself strangled? Why didn't he just beat her up like the rest of them? Meadows shrugged his rugby player's shoulders. It just went wrong. There was a movement on the other side of the trees. 
Diana Cooper was being brought to her final resting place in a procession which included the four men from the funeral parlour. They were carrying the basket, along with the vicar, Damien Cooper, and Grace Lavelle. Finally, Irene Laws followed behind at a discreet distance, her hands clasped behind her back, making sure that everything was being done correctly. There was no sign of Robert Cornwallis. You know what? I think your fear is a lot of shit, Hawthorne said. His language jarred with the setting, the sunlight, the cemetery, and the approaching coffin with its garland of flowers. You always were complete crap at the job, mate. And when you finally track down your mass dispatch rider, you can give him best wishes from me, because I bet you any money you like, he never went anywhere near Britannia Road. And you always were an insufferable bastard when you were in the Met, Meadows growled. You don't know how glad we were to see you go. It's just a shame what happened to your targets, Hawthorne responded, his eyes glittering. I hear they nosedived after I went. And while we're on the subject, it's too bad about your divorce. Who told you about that? Meadows jerked back. It's written all over you, mate. It was true. Meadows looked neglected. His crumpled suit, the shirt that hadn't been ironed and was missing a button, and his scuffed shoes all told one half of the story. He was still wearing a wedding ring, though, so either his wife had died or she had left him. Either way, the comments had hit home. In fact, I was almost expecting the two of them to come to blows, like Hamlet and Laertes on the side of the grave. But just then, the coffin arrived, and I watched as it was set down on the grass, the willow creaking. Two ropes ran underneath it, and the four pallbearers took a moment to run the ends through the handles, securing it, while Irene Laws looked on approvingly. I glanced at Damien Cooper. He was staring into the mid-distance, unaware of anyone around him. Grace was standing beside him, but there was no contact between them. She wasn't holding his arm. The photographers I had noticed earlier were some distance away, but their cameras had zoom lenses, and I imagined they could get everything they needed. It's time to lower the coffin, the vicar intoned. Let us all stand together, and maybe you'd like to hold hands while we take these last few moments to think about the very special life that has now ended. The coffin was lifted and manoeuvred over the grave that waited to receive it. The small crowd stood around, watching as it was lowered. The man with a handkerchief touched his eyes. Raymond Clunes had found himself standing next to Bruno Wang, and I noticed them exchange a few quiet words. The four pallbearers began to lower the coffin into the dark slit that was waiting to receive it. And then, quite suddenly, music began to play. It was a song, a children's song. The wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round, round and round. The wheels on the bus go round and round, all day long. The sound quality was thin and tinkly, and my immediate thought was that it was somebody's mobile phone. The mourners were looking among themselves, wondering whose it was and who was going to be embarrassed. Irene Laws stepped forward, alarmed. Damien Cooper was standing closest to the grave. I saw him look over the edge with an expression that was somewhere between horror and fury. He pointed down and said something to Grace Lavelle. That was when I understood. The music was coming from inside the grave. It was inside the coffin. The second verse began. The wipers on the bus go swish, 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 swish. The four pallbearers had frozen, not knowing whether to drop the coffin the rest of the way and hope that the depth of the grave would muffle the sound, or whether to pull it out again and somehow deal with it. Could they actually bury the dead woman with this hideously inappropriate song accompanying her? It was quite obvious now that the source of the music was some sort of digital recorder or radio inside the coffin. Had Diana Cooper chosen a more traditional material, mahogany, for example, there's every chance that we would have been unable to hear it. The dead woman might have been left to rest in peace, at least once the battery ran out. But the words were leaking out of the twisted willow branches. There was no escaping them. The driver on the bus goes, move on back. On the far side of the cemetery, the photographers raised their cameras and moved forward, 
sensing that something was wrong. At the same time, Damien Cooper lashed out at the vicar, not physically, but ferociously. He needed someone to blame, and she was close by.